G'day Fanatics, uh, Lenny here and I'm with Wally. G'day. Um, we just thought we'd have a bit of a chat about um, maybe like a week in review or what's been going on in Fanatics and mm. just dribble a bit as we do and get off topic and... Yeah. Yeah. Just chat it. Chat it out. So um, if you enjoy this, let us know um, and we'll continue doing them. If you don't, uh, shut up. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, look, send, write a comment in the comments below of what you might, or send us an email of what you want to hear or see or have us discuss, or if there's a question you've got, um, you can either post it in the comments below or um, send it into australianlawnfanatics at gmail.com. There'll and be some questions we can't answer though, mate. Yeah. If people ask things like, what's the meaning of life? Work it out for yourself, mate. <laughs> we won't be able to answer that. Meaning your life is having a nice lawn. That's all you need. I think that's all you that's need. Pretty much all you, you need. You need nice lawn, good fertiliser, yep. good quality of cut. And an impact sprinkler going in the background. Yeah, just some knockers. Just, just a... <laughs> <laughs> so what have we seen so far this... Well, like the last little while in the Fanatics, I think... Like the seasons are starting to change, so and we've had some wet weather around the place. So, um, I think a lot of guys with the buff are seeing um, leaf spot and maybe gray leaf spot, gray leaf spot, maybe some brown patch, rhizoctonia, yep, yep, whatever that means. Um, so, how would you get rid of that? I'd, I'd go for a proteone, is it? Ophrodine, Ophrodine. Yeah, maybe, or... Because well, that's a, like a broad-spectrum fungicide. Yeah, look, I think I think the challenge with um, with disease management is it <laughs> depends how progressive you are, you know. A lot of the time it's like an afterthought, like, oh, uh-oh, I've got disease, what do I do about it? Yeah. But I think... Um, get in front of the disease. Get in front of it. I think, well, you could probably look at some kind of preventative fungicide, but also, like, how do you culturally manage that disease out? Mm. Like, is it... Um, what did you do watering practice wise leading up to it? Yep. Did you not water enough? Yep. Um, were you over watering? Were you yep. watering at the wrong times of the day? Um, were you leaving too much moisture on the surface to leave? That's all kinds of things. What's your water quality like? Yeah. Um, if, you, if your water's high in salts or high in sodium, for example, you might be um, you know, changing the quality of your soil. Yep. And therefore, your plant can't uptake certain nutrients. And also, uh, how sharp your mower blades are has a big impact too. Yep. If you have dull mower blades and it's leaving a nice jagged cut, that's a that's a disease entry point for sure. Opens it up to disease. Also, like you, you got to think um, if you've thrown sand top dressing out recently. Um, Don't talk about sand top dressing. I'm still in trouble for doing it in April. I'm oh, still in goodness trouble. gracious. Well, you got to think about sand, like most sand, even if it is uh, rounded, it's still got that kind of sharpness to it. It's, it's mm-hmm. angular. Um, and, and when you throw that across the surface or broom it in or brush it in, it's abrasive. So it's going to cause really small lesions on the leaves of the turf grass. That's also an opportunity to open it up to, yeah, to diseases. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think other things that obvious is, is nutrition. What are you doing nutritionally? Yeah. Are, are you feeding enough? Also, are you feeding the right types of nutrition? Um, yep. You know, you might be giving it way too much nitrogen of the wrong source. You know, you might be um, you might be over delivering nitrogen and and fostering conditions for that disease. Yep. Conversely, you might not be um, doing anything with your um, your soil microbes. You might not be feeding your soil, so you might not be using a bias to high stimulants. Yeah. yeah. So you might not. Um, be creating an environment that's conducive to to um, mm, the little the little things that live in your soil are very important and you've got to feed them not as not just the grass on top yeah but don't don't lose track of what's important for turf grass like if you looked in terms of like a list of importance yeah um, in terms of like cultural controls you've probably got like some big ticket items you've got obviously sunlight yeah does your turf have enough sunlight yeah Sometimes I do. Sometimes. Sometimes I do. <laughs> Does your turf have enough moisture there to grow successfully? So, like, it's like a checklist. I would say yes, I do, because I, I water once or twice a week. 
depending yeah when i remember and then there's step three is like does your turf have the right amount of nutrition yeah and by nutrition i mean like okay so i've said priorities sunlight water nutrition but then nutrition you've got to get your priorities right like people say biostimulants are uh, like providing nutrition they don't um if you look in terms of like what's important and you rated it from like most important to least important it's probably nitrogen yeah potassium yeah phosphorus yeah magnesium yeah calcium sulfur all your other trace elements yeah so nitrogen if, like, like plenty of people have said nitrogen is the driver it's the big one yeah and it's the delivery of nitrogen and the source of nitrogen that's that's um pretty important to turf grass i find it fascinating um like home lawnies like we probably don't work out how much we're feeding mm. in terms of the amount of notch and we're putting on the ground but if you go to like most golf courses around the place or even guys running sports fields like you get taught at tafe how to work out how much nutrition you're putting down on the ground yeah basically um and if you can really like hone in how much you're putting down you can almost like hold your turf bar grass back or you can grow it a little bit more and if you get to the right happy medium of where mm. you know exactly the right amount you need and then exactly the right amount to get that little bit more growth or reduce a little bit more clipping yield or whatever it is yeah um you can really start to control what it is you're doing out on your lawn and also control the ingress of of your pests and diseases because it's a um it's probably a tech subject we should do in depth but how to work out yeah actual nitrogen yeah um because you'll see on a bag it'll say let's put two and a half kilos per hundred kgs of per hundred square meters um but your nitrogen delivery over the period of a year for a home lawn is what about three kilos of pure nitrogen or yeah, actual yeah. nitrogen most warm season turf and even even probably like cool season under like low duress like low stress where you're not wearing it like a sports field or yeah you're probably anywhere from two and a half to three and a half kilograms of actual nitrogen yeah any more than that you're probably going to result in and accumulating too much biomass and probably thatch, thatch that turf Thatchy grass mark. up. Yep. Um, so you start thinking about, okay, we've got a lot of fanatics interested in these new hybrids like the Tiff Tufts of the yep. world and the, the Agri Darks. Yep. I think all grasses have different growth rates, but the, the faster a turf grass grows, the more nitrogen it needs. It's just basic yeah. plant physiology because it's growing quicker. It needs to spread quicker. It needs to put more energy into its leaf growth. Yep, um, and it's it's actually proven that you know Tiff Tuff, for example, produces more gibberellic acid. Yep, and so that probably means zero to anyone. Um, but what gibberellic acid is is it elongates the mesophyll cells. Yeah, and it's the mesophyll cells that elongate the leaves of the turf grass yep. plant. And so Primo so, Max, like so a growth regulator. Now, see so what we'll do with these series um, is come at it from an independent point of view. Um, not representing specific companies um, will speak I suppose independently of that yeah because um, Wally's just here as Wally and I'm just here as Lenny and um, try to cut through all the rubbish um, and yeah sort of not represent anyone but just talk generally about the turf industry so yeah gibberellic acid is a, that's your growth regulator that you buy like your Primo or your Teenex or Re yeah, yeah, heaps of, heaps of different ones. They reduce. They the reduce. They reduce. Yeah, yeah. So, not completely, but to a point yep. where it then slows down the um, upright growth, and yep. the plant generally then proliferates more of its biomatter into, like we know in cool season it proliferates more biomass into tillering. Yeah. So like if you've got a, a ryegrass plant, um, tillering know, means it produces more leaves on on the bunch on the bunch yeah so yeah. It'll, it'll it'll produce extra leaves out from that parent plant which is what you would do for grooming if you're grooming yeah that can assist with creating cuts on the on the bunch yeah and you'll get more leaf growth off that which gives you a denser thicker sward of grass yeah you generally get divergent growth so if like, you create a nick you, and it's near a bud the, the plant will shoot out a, an, extra an extra stem yeah to grow from there um, 
there's a lot of different studies like in cool season you actually see sometimes quicker growings using growth regulators yep in warm season very, people are very sketchy about it but i have still seen from a lot of peer-reviewed scientific literature you get actually quicker lateral growth and so it's just so counterintuitive i'm going to go spray a growth regulator and my surface is going to cover in more quickly um, yeah just on that i noticed like let's say if you spray a pgr on on green cooch and your nodes on your stolons are let's say they're two centimeters apart yep hypothetically speaking when you spray a growth regulator that that brings that back to sort of half a centimeter is that right so when it says you'll you'll increase lateral growth you will but the lateral growth will be closer together yeah it definitely tightens so up like the node it, it won't shoot down. across the ground quicker yep but you'll you might see more yeah. lateral growth because it'll be denser yeah yeah and you'll probably find too um like i don't know how much research and i i, I could probably look into it for the punters out there but um like tiff tough for example we know it produces more gibberellic acid yeah should we be going at higher rates of growth regulator obviously you've got to go within label rates yeah but if you've got to negate more of the the growth yeah and it naturally produces more you probably have to suppress it more you'd need more active ingredients yeah. to suppress it um so obviously often they give you a range you yeah know, they'll give you a range five mil to 20 mil of let's say for instance well, so, so a lot of guys might go 10 or 15 because that works for them yeah but you might find that for one of those really aggressive hybrids you might need it might 20. not yeah it might it might actually need to be the higher rate because of the speed of growth yeah um but I think too, you know, we talk about growth regulation. There's a lot of ways you can regulate growth of turf grass. Mm. Like, well, starve it of nitrogen. Yeah, well, you starve it of nutrition, you starve it of moisture. Mm. Like you can naturally suppress um, growth through really winding it back. And the term that they use um, in the commercial side is, is running it lean. Yeah. Um, and a lot of what's really interesting is like when they go and play like a golf tournament on a surface, they generally run it to within an inch of its life. You know, yeah, yeah, everything's hand watered. It's all done for the TV, and then once the TV is gone, they one hundred percent. And those greens are on like the edge of, you know, if they switch the water off, those greens are going to die. Basically, <laughs> like that is how dry they run it because they know that if they get it to those lower moisture contents, particularly lower surface moisture contents, that ball is going to go quicker. Yeah, and it's going to be a firmer surface. Yeah. And so it's a more challenging surface to play on, mm. you know, and you see the effects of what's really interesting with golf tournaments. And sorry to diverge, but... Um, That's what we do. Yeah. <laughs> we get off track. Like we're talking about agronomy, but then you talk about how it applies to sports. So like you'll be watching, let's just use like a, a US Masters, for example, and it might be quite dry at the start of the tournament mm. and everyone shoots quite high scores because the greens are so fast yeah you get a storm come through on the saturday night and you got the sunday like the last day the the, greens are sticking there's there's soft days and, and you yeah. watch the scores go through the roof and mm. someone who's who's been playing a different style of golf so we talk about a few different styles of maybe golf. not a long bomber but a more accurate yeah more accurate striker. and like you call it target style where mm. they'd actually like try and hit the greens they'll probably score well on that day the guy who lays up for the par five rather than tries to hit it in two yeah mm. yeah and so it, it it's amazing like how much how closely linked like the agronomy and like the thinking around trying to control what the plant or what the turf grass is doing but also what the soil underneath is doing yeah to the playability of the game mm. you know even um you know the same thing but in like a, say in a football scenario you've got to run that pitch at a certain moisture content yeah and there's a certain match day watering schedule yeah. to make sure that that ball skids on you know we're talking these real real little like one percenters like you think of um i think the perfect example is probably like um the uk cycling team like that like for shoot cycling in the olympics yeah like everyone's almost on this like level playing and it's like what can you do like really slightly differently to eat to improve to really like just 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 nudge it that little bit forward Mm. And when we think about like turf grass and turf grass nutrition, um, what nudges that like little bit of nutrition forward is 
lot of those additives that they put in foliar fertilizers or biostimulants. Yep. It's like it's it's like an amino acid. It might be a, a surfactant that makes that droplet spread further. That might give it each singular droplet twenty percent more efficiency. Or um, th there is so much technology there that probably goes missing. That really what what it does is achieve that one percent extra yeah. on just a basic nutrient program. Yeah, yeah, right. I remember last year I was uh, with Rusty, fortunate enough to go to State of Origin 3 in Sydney as a groundsman for the day, which was oh, the best day. Um, the next day we went out to the Bankwest Stadium, this, it was, which was pretty new at the time, and yep. it's you know, still new, I suppose. But the tech that got under the turf there is unbelievable. It's, you know, it's a big sand profile, and it's they got pipes under the turf where they turn pumps on and blows air up into the root system every day. Sub air and that can yeah. that vacuum also? Yeah, yeah, sucks. yeah. So if it's yeah. if it's pounding down rain, they can turn it into a vacuum and it'll suck moisture out of the profile. So the profile will be dry or you know, they'll suck it down from seventy yeah. percent moisture to yeah. twenty. Yeah. Um but there'll still be like the little the, the leaf will be wet still. Yeah. But there won't be any pooling of water because they can suck out an astronomical amount of water per hour. Yeah. And because the whole, the whole field is in one pool liner. Yeah, you got to think about how that's that's like the equivalence of like growing turf grass almost hydroponically. Because yeah. you can pretty much control, well, you can control the airflow around your roots. Yeah. You can control They have the, it every day. Like they run it every day almost yeah. there, right? And you can control the, the moisture levels mm. around your roots. What they didn't go for was um, the subsurface heating. They, yeah, okay. they, they didn't do that yet. And what, that was an option they could do, was to have cooling for hot days and heating for cold days. Um, but they, because of the temperate climate of Australia, where we don't have the sub-zeros, because it was designed for NFL stadiums. Yeah, well, I suppose with climate appraisal, like when they look into turf grasses, they like know the rain, like, it, m most punters would know the ranges of like what turf grasses can handle. Like, mm. uh, you know, we know a warm season can probably handle some of the more cool tolerant varieties. You're probably 10, 12 degrees, like there's still this real slight growth, a teeny on yeah. degrees Celsius, but they'll handle well upwards of high 30 degree temperatures. But you got to look at the average temperature as well. So yep. like the average daytime temperature and the average nighttime. And you know, when we talk about temperatures and people in their mind, like they go, can you can take a ride through the summer there. Um, with that kind of system, maybe you'd be able to have a transitional pitch the whole time of year because your average temperature, so like, even though it gets hot out in the west of Sydney, like it might be high 30, that nighttime temperature yeah. cools it down a bit. So it's probably on the high averages for, for ryegrass, but off the, over the course of a year, Probably not too bad a region mm. to grow a perennial ryegrass. Over they're running, the they're running um, agridark coops with rye in with it. rye for winter. Yeah. Uh, it's so interesting. It's probably rye right for it'll probably be rye right for like six, maybe seven months of the year. Mm. Maybe Joel, Joel too good, who's in our group in the yeah. fanatics. He's he's um, hit him up, mate. He's he's there. He, he's at banquet. He can choose. Some he batch. did the tour. He showed us the. Um, the guts of the stadium, which is fantastic. Yeah. Really, really, really great experience. Um, so another topic, serious stuff. What what biscuit would you say represents what variety of grass? Oh mate, you got to put that out to the punters, mm. don't you? Well, yeah, I think there should be some group involvement in that. But oh well, um, well I've thought about this. <laughs> I've had a huge amount of time to think about this because I think mm. about weird stuff like this. I have weird dreams about oh, grass. God, he's got a weird grass brain. This guy. I had this weird dream one day where, like, I was mowing like on this like really gentle slope, but I just couldn't, I couldn't grab the mower. It would just like stay like just in front of me, and I think like I just had this. Don't analyze. I just don't had this fear analyze. like I wasn't able to turn the mower around to mow it back up the hill. Yeah, it's a weird. It was the worst dream. <laughs> you know, you weren't in control of your mower. Yeah, yeah. Biscuits. Biscuits. Um, okay. Yeah, right. Um, right, so where do we start? All right, let's look at... Um, I think I think we should start with buffalo, because that's, you know, that's... 
It's oh, like mate. a narrow route, really, isn't it? Is it narrow route? I reckon it's more an ice bobo. Nice bobo. Because you got to think about it, like, what's the, what's like the classic biscuit? <laughs> it's just, a, what's the classic biscuit when you'd go around to like your grandma's house? Yeah. That everyone knew about. Yeah. But like, it was just, it always existed. It's so synonymous with Australia. It's like, um, like, because Buffalo, like, that name's uniquely Australian. Like, if you went to yeah, the States it's, and it's said, St. Augustine. We grow a lot of buffalo grass. You're talking prairie grass, like, where, you know, Wild West movies, where they're yeah, like yeah, cowboys yeah. and Indians, like, that swishy. It's, it's St. Augustine for them. Yeah. Um, which sounds weird. For so, us. like, the name's uniquely Australian. Yeah. It's just got that, like, it's just classic, like. So, Ice Bobo or maybe a Kingston. Yeah, I'd say Kingston. Yeah. It's just like that. It's a classic stayer in the biscuit mm. arsenal. So, um, your common, common cooches? Oh, mate. Yeah. That's yeah. tough, you know. It's probably... Like a Jack's or a Ritz. Yeah, probably. Like, you could go Savory's, but if we... Because kept... they're good. Because they're good with the things on them. Yeah, well, if you, if, you, <laughs> if you really hone in, you know, you can't strike up a Jack's you biscuit. You can't strike up a Jack's, but you can put some bloody cheese and I tell you the, on it. I'll tell you the other thing. It could be like, you know... <laughs> You think about it, you think about like the family assorted mix mm. where you've got that's the, the green cooch family, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like the shortbread creams, yeah, it's like the orange creams and that, the delta, like the chocolate cream, mm. you know, like there's something for everyone. The chocolate chip, which is probably the hybrids, you know, the sports cooches, yeah, yeah, they're, yeah, or, or the um, or they're the oh, um, you're going with like the standard nod cream version of assortment because there's, well, there's, no. there's two packs of assortment. Well, maybe there's the hybrid. There's like the one you get at like those weird, well, I've never been to a PNC meeting, but my dad was a school principal. <laughs> but like, you'd go to like... Mate, all my relatives were um, ministers in the Salvation Army, so... Yeah, well, it's like that weird, like... If no, you want to make two litres of cordial, make make a hundred litres of, of, of mix. Yeah, That's how, it's how you like, can do it's, it. it's <laughs> the weakest cordial, and they never yes. get the cream, to, like the cream version of assortment. It was always no. like the cheaper, yeah, yeah, like the just the st standard biscuits. Yeah, I no, think, well, we can go with that. Yeah, for sure. Like so. we gotta go. Wow, well, we gotta go cream. Like, coach, coach has improved to what it was once. Yeah, you know, it's it's not the the PNC meeting anymore. No, you know, so it's probably a um, it's probably a more Monte like Carlo. A, maybe. Well, like a yeah, hybrid coach probably is Monte Carlo. Mm. I reckon. Mm. Um, it's got the potential. To you know, for it to go wrong if you squeeze it too hard. You know? Yeah, to um, me, really, like it's a TV snack. I love it. <laughs> Original TV snacks, not snacks, not these mold sticks. Hybrid coach. Yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. Well, what do you reckon? Um, well, uh, Zoysia japonica then. Something slow. Something that does what it wants when it wants. <laughs> Does what it wants. What about um? Yeah. It's in its own sweet time. If you if you like, okay, so you got like japonica, which is like the broadleaf empire. Um, yeah, it's kind of like the um the uglier cousin to like the zoysia matrella. Matrella would be shade tough and Sir Grange and Sir Grange. Yeah, so um, like you've got like one that's like just bloody beautiful, but it's almost unattainable. Would and that, like it, you know, yeah. you think about biscuits, like there's probably two that spring to mind for me for. For like the Zoysia Mitrellas, it's probably a Tim Tam. Yeah, or, or dark chocolate Tim Tam, because they're bloody hard to get. Yeah, they're hard to find. Or is it like, you know like the ultimate chocolate chip, the ones that have like 40% chocolate chips? Chips in. Ahoy? Those yeah, ones? like yeah. the ones that are like like decadent, like there's yeah. there's almost like more chocolate than there is batter mix. I, was, I can't remember the name of it, but I was thinking the, um, there's a long, like a finger of biscuit with uh, like a marshmallow and it's cut and coated in chocolate. I can't remember what that one called. Royales with it with the E, Royale with cheese. Yeah. <laughs> it's a round one. It's puffy. It's not a finger. It's round yeah. and puffy. Yeah, yeah. it's like marsh. It's got marshmallow jam. Yeah. It's got like a shortbready biscuit, mm. and then it's coated in like a thin mm. chocolate. That's your, that's your Zoysia, isn't it? That's not far. That's mm. probably a. That's probably a. Um, I reckon that's probably a Japonica. Could be. It's, yeah. it's like that that puffier cousin to the <laughs> to, to your classic dark chocolate tin tin. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Covering, covering the big issues. Do you, <laughs> do you think your um, your kaiku, it's got to be like your kaiku biscuit? Yeah, oh, it's a classic. Anzac it's biscuit. a classic. It's a stayer. It's, it's there. You know, yeah, it's and, and you can't kill them. Anzac it generally biscuits, looks, you can't kill them. It looks pretty good around Anzac Day, so yeah, you know, it always looks pretty good in that autumn yeah. period. Even though it's from South Africa, 
Well, um, it's got it grows in a place of high altitude, so yeah. like it, where it's naturalised was native to. Now it's naturalised to, and you, you see it, you know, most a lot of southern Australia. It's a bloody weed. Um, it it's does. Everywhere. It does slow down. Yeah. But under good management, I've but seen so that. I suppose it's like. You know, a lot of people, you can have bad and, we, and we don't want to go into too many political issues, but a lot of South Africans have moved to Australia, just like Kaikiyu. Well, it would have been interesting, like, when you when you think about the history of grasses and the history of biscuits... Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, but the history of grasses... So if you're a South African out there, in the fanatics, and you can tell us what an iconic South African biscuit would be, or cookie, whatever you want that to would, call it, that would yeah. that'd probably assist us. Well, that could... Would, would Queensland Blue Cooch cater for that? Because that was from a Mascarene island. That was from an island off off the coast of South Africa. Or yeah, it's right. a South African. So everyone thinks Queensland blue cooch because in the name, mm. right? So Digiteria didactyla, as we go, and yeah. it's sub variants. Yeah. And actually, Aussie blue isn't a straight didactyla for all those players at home. So it's not a Aussie blue is not really a blue cooch. Well, it, it, it is, half it? is, and then it's crossed with the Swazilandris. That's why it gets that kind of tufting habit more than a. Uh, running habit, yeah. but see that would probably that would have to be like an, a mainstay, like you know maybe orange creams. Ooh. You know, mm. some people either really love them, mm. but it's really hard to like maintain a, a good orange cream following, you know. Yeah. And so it's really hard to maintain a Queensland Blue Cooch lawn to a really prestige mm. quality. Johnny, Johnny's got um, Aussie Blue. Yeah. So it's Gibbo. Gibbo's got any blue. See, well. Aussie blue is definitely more aggressive, way more yeah. shade tolerant. You know, um, who does who has Queensland blue? My my old boy's got Queensland. Your blue. dad's got it. Yeah. I uh, can't think of anyone off the top of my head. So all right. Interesting thing about Queensland blue is no one just has Queensland blue because mm. it's just an open. It's it's it'll outcross, and there's so many subtypes of it. Yeah. Like what? Bill Bloggs has is different to what Johnny Depp has. Johnny Depp off the road. He's an eat straw. Anyway, let's not discuss him. Um, oh, but that's what I was going to say about grasses before. Mm. So when you look at the origins of grasses, there, there's this long-held belief the that chips, the chip packages fell over. Like there's also zoysia uh, macranthus, which are like yep. native, but I don't think they're native. I think they're more naturalised, and they believe it's naturalised from the shipping. So they used to be packing yep. in the ships, like all this, all the like use just long cut grass to pack whatever it may be. Oh yeah, and okay, because it's ship, light and... Yeah, yeah, when ships would run aground, mm. all this stuff would float, there might have been seed in it, floats to the coast, sets root, and Off they reckon um, a lot of the naturalised Bermudas, like naturalised cooches, yep. a lot of that huge potential for when the Dutch in WA, a lot of that may have originated. It's a uh, Jean Claude Van Damme guy. <laughs> yeah. No, no, probably like the, you know, on the bounty kind of approach. Yeah. You know, like the, I don't know, it would have, when they, you know, 1600s or whatever, when they were sailing up down that coastline. Yep. A lot of the packing, you know, if a ship mm -hmm. ran aground, um, you know, and if, you, if you're interested for finding some treasure, and I'm not talking about like treasure and ships, <laughs> But just, I'm talking about like grass treasure. Yeah. Some of those naturalised Bermudas or naturalised green cooches along that coastline of WA are just super survivalist plants. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Trent. Think of it off the top of my head. Sorry, Trent. <laughs> um, he's a good guy. He's got a 25 inch Podia 12 blade thing. Good Impressive. mile. Yeah, good mile. Um, all right, Dollar Spot. Dollar Spot's been around everywhere. <laughs> oh, people have piped up about Dollar Spot yeah. all week. No. It's hard It's hard to get rid of Well, there are ways to get rid of it. I mean, Bumper is of the obvious. Ooh, ooh see yeah. that? Bugger flying. As the stat goes, Dollar Spot, Dollar Spot bumper is the um, the fungicide everyone goes for, right. but you can you can fert it out, can't you? Well, see, well, yeah, it helps. But the problem with winter growth and ferting out, yeah, well, out, finessing it out, it's, you, you 
you're not going to get yeah. it. Well, you spoke about growth rate before, mm. but also, um, just as as the stat goes, dollar spot is the disease that gets the most money spent on it, controlling it worldwide yeah, right. in turf grass. So that's an impressive stat. Think about it. You know, come one, come all. Like if you've got dollar spot, so does ten other people in your street probably. Um, they just don't know it yet, or they're not interested in it. Mm. Um, but there are like a, a, like a number of cultural methods, and a, they've done a fair bit of research. You mentioned nitrogen before. Source of nitrogen, so different types of nitrogen does not matter. Yeah. Um, uh, but yeah, generally supplying more nitrogen than probably what what what, what you once were uh, will increase dollar spot. Dew, what about dew if suppression? Got... So if you can get the dew off the surface of the leaf. Yeah. Um, and really, when you think about it, uh, there would be areas down south where you get dew, a heavy onset of dew, quite prevalent for a long period of time. But mm. but in like probably from Sydney, like up here, um, there'd be a couple of weeks where if you just got out on your lawn, long bit of yellow tongue or something, and just brushed the dew off, it doesn't take very long. It'd be lucky if it was five to 10 minutes. Yeah. That would go a long way, probably up to 90% improved cultural control of, of your dollar spot. Yeah. The other one is, is more regular rolling, but um, that's generally done on, those studies are done on a lot of putting greens. So like they'll, um, they'll look at a rolling regime where it might be once a week, twice a week, three times a week, or every year, every day. Or, and, and then you think about, okay, well, what am I using to roll? Well, if you're real mowing, there's your roller there. Yeah. If you've got a roller, there's a roller. But it's probably the reason rolling works, it sounds so like random, rolling. Why would rolling work? Rolling increases the moisture in the leaf. If you increase the moisture or the sap flow in the leaf, um, it actually reduces the potential for, for dollar spot formation in, in the leaf, the actual disease dysphorylates. Hmm. Yeah, but then it's weird because if the surface of the leaf is moist from dew, then it's like the opposite effect. Yeah. So, have you ever played coin up the Kyber? What the hell is that? Well, it's a... <laughs> I don't like the word of it, but it was a game we used to play when we were hammered drunk at the footy club. Um, it involves a, um, a shot glass, and you put a shot glass down, and then you grab a dollar coin or whatever, and you, you wedge it between your budget, <laughs> and you wiggle over, <laughs> and you try and drop it in the, in the shot glass. Gosh, I'll, show I'll show you how. <laughs> So now you know how to play uh, coin up the coin. So it's almost like coin footy. <laughs> <laughs> you know that? That's really? gonna that's gonna come back to haunt me. Isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> you know that game you play at school where you like yeah. was it three things and then you had to get to the end of the table and like flick it to yourself and then score a goal. <laughs> not far off it, mate. Not far. Yeah, not far. <laughs> coin up the coin. I think you've had to have a more few more beers drunk. to oh, play that one. Hundreds, <laughs> hundreds of beers. <laughs> All of the beers. <laughs> <laughs> um, how long have we been going? We've been going a good half an hour, I'd say. So, um, have you got another topic? We'll do one more topic and then um, we'll call it quits on that. And yeah, well, actually, we were talking about, Sam, we are talking about top dressing materials before. It seems to be a lot of that has come up on the page. People mm. starting to think about their renovations. Yeah. And the kind of material that they're going to use. Yeah. I would say a great way work out what you should be using or what you want to achieve is, is to, it sounds it sounds wanky yeah but write down your goals 
What's your lawn goals? What do you want to like, achieve? Do you want a bowling green look? So you probably yep. need something that's going to pack quite hard, be quite aerated, like mm. so you know it, it can actually flatten. You want to reel mow it. If you want that, you probably need a higher percentage of sand. Yeah. And to work it, work out like initially where you're at, a jar test is the obvious one. Yeah. You know, you take a few soil samples around on your lawn. Um, you mix it. You mix it together in a bucket. You take a subsample in a jar. You shake it up, and then you watch how it settles. Yep. Sand, silt, clay, and then yep. you generally can mark or measure with a ruler. Give, give yourself a rough idea of the percentage. And so, if you know what depth you're coring to, or what depth you, if you're rebuilding your lawn or whatever, or you're going to lay turf, and you know what depth you're cultivating to, yep. Then it's just mathematics. Uh. So if you've got Let's just say 100 square meters of lawn. Yep. And you've got 10 centimeters that you've subsampled, or you want to make changes to the 10 centimeters. Yep. It's roughly, well, it's 10 cubes mathematically. Yeah. But because if you work out the percentages of your sand, silt, and clay, it might be you times it by 1.2 or 1.3. So it might actually be 13 cubes of soil that you've got sitting there. Yeah. Because right. of yep. the term um, bulking factor. Yeah. Um, and so then you go, okay, I want a sandier soil. Then you need to bring in an amount of sand to make a percentage change. Yeah. So if you've got half of that is sand, 50% of that is sand. So if you've got 13 cube, yeah. six and a half cubic meters of that is it's sand. sand. Yeah. And so if you bring in, let's just say you brought in another two cube of sand, yeah. it's gonna make it eight and a half in, in the total of, of the, of the, of the 13. Yeah. 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 So, when you're working out your top dress, generally I, I would suggest you'd go one cube per hundred square meters is a is a yeah, it's, skim coat. It's unless a unless you're almost to where you want to be, then you drop it down to half. For cube. most sand, it's six to eight millimeters. Yeah, of sand. Yeah, and and, oh. and 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 you can look. You can dump a heap on and level it out, and and you'll grow across or grow up, but. Look, you're losing the use of your lawn for months at a time for that to happen. So ideally, top dressing, you do a little bit at a time and just skim it up. And just They call it dusting, so just yeah. dust a little bit at a time. You, you yeah. can do it, and I'll do it on plenty of people's lawns, is go a nice thick thing and they just keep the kids, or they don't have kids, or they don't have dogs, or whatever. They, they Their lawn is what they do, sort of thing. So yeah. you can go heavy, but you know, many skim coats is better. And and make sure you're blending it, like yeah. like you're either if you've got a quite a high percentage of clay, mm. and you don't punch holes and you just go put sand down, mm. basically you're just going to have sand sitting on top of clay. Yeah, it just it'll create problems. Yeah, oh you um, always aerate first. You, always. You, yeah, especially core aerate. Yeah, um, tine aerating is you winter. Only get the benefits out of sand, like adding sand if you've got quite a sandy profile. Yeah. Um, because you've got to think, um, clay is so dense. Mm -hmm. You put a time through it, you probably eventually get more compaction like around that that core hole. Eventually, it, it can it can depend on depend what what the time does when it's in the surface. Well, I think that's because exactly if it, right. Like, if it goes directly up and down, yeah, you're going to compact around. Well, that with edge. a drum aerator, you would. So with a drum yeah. aerator, you'd, you're not going to get. We, when we talk about um, aeration, we talk about alleviating compaction. Mm. Um, and with a drum aerator, you're generally just going straight up and down, and there's no kind of down, like in, it and then it elongates that hole too. Like, yeah. there's, I, I honestly think there's a limit to how deep you can go with a drum aerator because you know if you're going going to go five inches, when it goes in the soil, as it comes out, it's squashing that front edge yeah. forward, yeah, and and creating. Oh, I think it creates a lot of problems. Um, yeah, when it with a reciprocator. It's going up and down. Um, some of them, like the the ones that run on a crank, come down and they push the machine forward by just twisting a little bit, going in in. And you've seen it when I've done the greens out at SGRI for you. Yeah. It it just flicks and it just cracks that profile that little bit. Yeah, yeah. So some of them, you know, you can you can use a solid and it'll it'll it will actually aerate. Um, there are some that, you know, particularly really needle tines they're, they're designed to create more compaction yeah 
Because you've got bowling greens and the like, they want them. I think, I think, I think it's, it's that, but it's also, it's just breaking surface tension. Yeah. Because you talk about things that are, like sand, if you get, you talk about top dressing with sand, there's so many different types of sand, different granule sizes of sand. Mm -hmm. You know, the larger the granule size, um, obviously the more coarse it is, it's called coarse sand, um, but also um, the more open it is. Yeah. Um, which means your capillary rise is much less. Yeah. Whereas the finer the granule size, so the more fine you go down the chart, the the more pores there are per unit area. Yeah. Um, and then the higher your capillary rise or like will be. Yeah. And so like if you're trying to like I would just generally say like a medium fine or just a medium kind of wash pit sand is probably pretty good for ninety percent of people's lawns yeah um, and then people go well, what about organics what about this what about that um, you'd probably find that like if it's just like a homogenous home lawn that you've never done anything to you'd probably find that the organic rate would be probably be fine yeah um, and then you if you want to add organics you have to add it by weight because people try and add organics by fertilizer and you just do not get enough you know if no. you, like we're talking like if you added six kilos of of a organic amendment, like a, uh, like, uh, let's just say a, a lot of a lot of products you can buy, they claim changes in moisture content, yeah, and they claim changes in increasing your carbon content, which they do over an extremely extremely long period of time. Yeah, um, you got to look at well, what the cation exchange capacity of that granule is. There's so, another tech talk we need to do. CC. Yeah, exchange. so so that's the ability of of of, of that um, that granule to exchange and GDD, yeah, yeah, yeah. to exchange cations, um, and so most of those are rated between like a hundred to one hundred and forty milli equivalents per liter, which yep. means that um, that's one hundred and forty parts per liter. Mm. So that means per liter of that product, mm. you're putting out one hundred and forty parts per million cation exchange capacity. That's a lot. A sand-based, a new sand-based putting green might be 10, uh, 10, uh, what is it, um, what are we looking, we're looking uh, a CC of 10, and to change change that CC, so like if you're talking 140 parts per million, by adding it at 6 kilos per 100 squares, you're probably going to be lucky if you change it by 0.1 of a percent. Yeah. Like, in terms of like spreading fertilizer over there, to change... So if you actually want to change your cation exchange, you want yeah. to change the amount of organics in your soil, then you have to blend it with your top dressing. Yeah, so if, you, if you're worried about what you've got in the soil now, and you're kind of looking at dumping a heap on the surface and rotary holding it in. Yeah, that's pretty much one of the ways. The other way is if you, if you know you're gonna aerate year on year for a long period of time, like 10 years, and you're gonna do it. And you should do, do it yearly. Yeah. At least yeah. yearly. Like if you really want a good lawn, you do it but twice But if you knew you were gonna do it twice a year, mm. um, and you were gonna add it at that specific rate, at six kilos or whatever it was, yeah. and you were happy to do it over that many apps and make that change ever so slowly, then you'd probably get there 0.1 of a percent every time you do it, so twice a year, 0.2 of a percent. Yeah. Within a period of five years, yeah. you're gonna change your cation exchange capacity by 1%. Yeah. Which, when you're talking um, what effect that has in visually seeing it on the surface and moisture content, it's negligible. Yeah. So to actually achieve real change, you either have to do it at construction. <laughs> yeah. Or risk it and just spread heaps of organic matter, which is not advisable. Well, I see, yeah, people say you should throw compost down as top dressing, but... Dangerous. To me, really dangerous. To me, if compost does what it's supposed to do, break down. It, yeah, well, it, it ends up disappearing, and you're back to where you well, started. Well, it's, it's not only that. See, compost will have there will be inert aspects in compost. Like there will be probably portions of or particles yeah. that eventually will break down and migrate into the pore spaces of your soil. Mm. And so there's a real danger of just surface applying compost. Yeah, like solid compost, and then you know. Yeah, you'll get this initial growth, and, and sometimes you see the opposite. You see a high sodium hasn't been broken down properly, and you get this yellowing on your leaves and your turf. But generally, what you see is this initial growth, and you go, wow, gee, it's done a lot. But what you see in like a year and two years is all of a sudden the drainage.
drainage on your lawn starts to struggle. Mm. You get surface moisture. You might start to see disease you've never seen before. And it's because that compost as it's broken down has migrated into the pore spaces of the soil. Yep. And more or less caps it. I can imagine, um, you know, just beautiful, nice draining, you know, sandy clay loam or sandy loam or, or just sand or whatever it is. Um, and then you add compost to it and all those fines go into like all the holes where the water would have gone. Yeah. Where does the water go? Yeah, it doesn't, it pulls on the surface and creates disease. And when, when, when you, like, because warm season turf is like a survivalist plant, it'll, it'll grow to like the depths that it needs to grow to. Like if you mm. water deep, it'll get deep roots. Um, it's kind of, you reap what you sow. So if you bring that, mo if you capture that moisture at the surface and you don't yep. get deep moisture, you'll uh, you'll actually um, foster like shortening of your roots yep. and the plant will just be weaker. Like it, it won't need to grow deep roots. Mm. And so it will just generally be weak. You know, even if you aerate, you'll probably find that the recovery from the aeration and the recovery from a scarification would take way longer because yeah. you have such a shallow root system. Yeah, we might wind it up there. I remember when Ricey, um, Simon Rice, um, when he ripped out his Santa Ana for he, when he rebuilt his house, he found that when he dug a, a retaining wall out, mm. he found roots from his Santa Ana 450 mils deep. Yeah, yep. That's how that's that's why Cooch is the alpha grass. You'll never get rid of it. It's great. Anyway, thanks for uh, watching and listening and doing all the things that you do. Um, like I said earlier, if you uh, liked it, give us a thumbs up. Subscribe to the channel. Um, Grip and rip. Grip it and rip it. Just send it. <laughs>